to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the scripture says we are to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude verse 3. We welcome you today to our study of Answering Denominational Doctrines. Today we're going to be considering what the Methodist Church teaches versus what the Bible teaches. And friend, all we ask of you today is to have your Bible handy as we're going to let the Word of God in kindness and in love, we're going to let the Word of God be our guide as it relates to the doctrines of men. As always, we want to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. The Church of Christ would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Uh, if you could come to one of their worships or Bible studies on Sunday or Wednesday, they'd be more than happy to have you as a guest there. You will find people in the Lord's Church who love God, who love the Word of God, and who are concerned about souls. And friend, we also want to help you in your study of the Word of God and your uh, desire to know more about God and His will at the Gospel of Christ. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com? We've got a good amount of Bible study material that is available for all free of charge. Just visit our website. We've got video lessons available audio lessons, we've got written transcripts and study questions as well. We've got a, a, just a wide variety of good Bible study material that will help one as well. Also, don't forget to check out our app on both the Android and Apple Store, Google Play Store. We have free apps that are available that also might help you as well in your study of the Word of God. And friend, if you've got a, a Bible question, you'd like to study the Bible further or know more about God and His will, won't you write to us or email us or call us at the information given and we'll be happy to help you in that endeavor. Today we're thinking about the doctrines of the Methodist Church. And friend, from the outset, we hope that you'll listen real carefully. I have good friends who are members of uh, the Methodist Church. I know good, sincere, morally upright people who are concerned about God and, and things uh, that are religious in nature. And so our beef, our, our, we have no animosity. We are not upset or angry with anyone personally as it relates to our study of Methodist doctrine. But friend, we do find as we look to the Scripture that there are several teachings of the Methodist Church that are just not compatible with the teachings of the Scripture. And so we want to consider today the doctrine and the teaching of the Methodist Church. What do we know about their doctrine? One of the things that the Methodist Church has is a book of discipline. And in this book of discipline, it will give official rules and regulations of the church along with the articles of faith. Now this book is a man-made book written and made by men and yet often it is venerated, it is raised up to a place of religious status that is looked at as an authority and as a guide. Friend, let's realize that part of the problem that occurs in religious organizations today is when men insert their ideas and their doctrines and claim that their books are authoritative. When the Bible says only the Word of God is to be followed. The Bible says this in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, that is God breathed, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, listen to this now, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friend, what we challenge people today with is this. The Bible says Scripture makes man complete. 
the Bible says the inspired Word of God can completely furnish us for every good work. If that's true, friend, why do we need confessions of faith? Why do we need books of discipline? Why do we need manuals and creeds and, and things of that nature? Let's let the Bible be our only guide in all matters. We're not to add to or take away from the Word of God. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. We're not to listen to any other gospel. Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. And we simply need to stay with the Word of God. If any man speaks, the Bible says, let him speak as the oracles of God. Friend, another major doctrine that is very popular in the Methodist church is the doctrine of faith only. Methodists teach, wherefore, that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort. It was Martin Luther who made statements like that, and maybe in that statement as well. And uh, when we think about the idea of solo faith or faith only, friend, we're not denying the power of faith. Jesus said in John 3, 16, God so loved the world. He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, it was our Lord who said, Unless you believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. John chapter 8, verse 24. The problem is not in the idea of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, verse number 6. The problem is when we insert words like only. Wherefore, that faith we are justified by faith only is a very wholesome doctrine and full of comfort. Friend, is it the case that man is justified just as if he never sinned, saved by faith only? Well, friend, when you read the Bible, that's not what the Scriptures teach. The Bible doesn't teach that we're justified by faith only. In fact, the Bible says we're not justified. Here's what's great about the Bible. Now, friend, I want you to listen real carefully to what we're going to say here. Men, Martin Luther, Methodist doctrine will say, we're justified by faith only. The Bible will come back and explicitly say, you're not justified by faith only. Now listen carefully. The Bible explicitly says, we're not saved by faith only. I don't mean it, it infers or it implies. I'm talking about verbatim, word for word says, the exact opposite of what Methodist doctrine is teaching. Now let me show you in your own Bible. Would you look in James chapter 2, and I want you to notice verse number 24 with me. Turn in your Bible to James chapter 2, and I want you to notice what James says in a great chapter about faith and faith being active and faith not just being a mental as sin alone. James says in James 2, 24, You see then that a man is justified by works. Now here's the only instance of faith only in the Bible. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by Faith only. Friend, we believe, we, the Bible teaches faith is essential. You've got to believe in Jesus. But as you think about works, we're not talking about you can do enough good deeds or you can say enough Hail Marys or you can be a righteous enough person to earn your way to heaven. But in the Bible, there are conditions. There are actions. There are conditional actions or works that I must do to be saved. For example, does the Bible teach you've got to do more than just have faith alone to be saved? Well, sure, you've got to repent. Luke 13, verse 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Now, friend, how do I know that to be saved, apart from the fact that the Bible says faith alone doesn't justify, how else do I know that I can't be saved just at the point of belief? Well, let me give you an example. James 2.19, that same chapter, is one of the clearest examples to show that not everybody who does have faith alone is going to be saved. In fact, there's a group in this context that you'll even admit aren't saved at the point of faith alone. Look in James 2 verse 19. You believe there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Now friend, the demons have faith. They realize there is, they believe in God. They realize that God is the true and living God. And the demons, how do they react? They believe and tremble. If all it takes is faith alone, then are the demons going to be saved? Well, of course not. 
a demonic type of faith is just a mental acceptance alone. And friend, you never find in the Bible that's all you've got to do to be saved. In fact, Jesus clearly taught against that. Matthew 7, 21, the Lord said, It's not everybody that looks up in heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. Not enough just to say, I recognize and I've got faith in Jesus. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, that's going to heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The Lord chastised the religious elite of His day in Luke 6, 46 when He cried out, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? And then it was the inspired writer who said in Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9, that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. And so we consider the idea of faith only. And friend, when we, faith only, when we look to the Bible, such is not taught in the scriptures that all you've got to do to be saved is to have faith. We also have to do the rest of what God tells us. And then as we consider Methodist doctrine, the Methodist church also teaches uh, error concerning the condition of man after Adam and Eve sinned. They will say in Article 8 of their Articles of Faith, the condition of man after the fall of Adam is such that he cannot turn and prepare himself by his own natural strength and works to faith and calling upon God. We, we, we hear overtones of Catholicism or uh, Calvinism in this when it says that you can't save yourself, you can't turn and prepare yourself by your own choice. God has to do it. Well, friend, the Bible again teaches that each person has a free moral agency. That is that you can decide for yourself to obey the gospel and that you can and must call on God out of your own will. Joshua said this in Joshua 24 verse 15, Joshua told the people of Israel, choose for yourselves this day whom you will follow and whom you'll obey. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Acts 10 verse 34, they made the choice to obey God. And, and in every account in the Bible, nobody forces, the Holy Spirit doesn't make, God doesn't overtake anybody's mind and will. You can, by your own decision and own desire, decide to obey God and do what the Lord says uh, to become a Christian. And friend, then we want to mention this idea. We want to point out some clear things that are in contradiction, clear contradiction with the teaching of the Bible. And one of those that the Methodists have adopted is concerning women preaching. The Methodist manual says that women can preach, teach, be pastors and bishops in the Methodist organization. Their manual says on May the 4th, 19 and 56 in Minneapolis in the General Conference of the Methodist Church approved full clergy rights for women. Half a century later, the fruits of that action are nearly 12,000 United Methodist clergy women who serve the church at every level from bishops to local pastors. Friend, we, we want to mention and we want you to listen real carefully now. Women in the church of God, faithful Christian women are essential, are important, ought to be looked up to ought to be you know really thought of well for their life but the Bible teaches there is a distinction in the roles and that the Bible clearly teaches women are not to be preachers this is not something that the Bible just hints at or there's some overtones of here we find and we want to show a clear contradiction between Methodist doctrine and the teaching of the Bible. I want you to notice this for yourself. Look in your Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and I want you to see where this idea clearly contradicts the teaching of the Scripture. Listen to 1 Timothy 2 verses 11 and 12. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Now watch the clarity of this. And I do not Permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. All right, let's make the comparison as clear and as concise as we know how. 
The Methodist manual and the Methodist church has voted and decided that women can be preachers and preach and teach over and have authority over a man. So Methodist church does, okay? Here's what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit says in 1 Timothy 2.12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to be an authority over a man. Friend, this is not, well, it sounds different or maybe it's not quite the same. These ideas are diametrically opposed. When If I believe the Bible is the Word of God, and if I believe the Bible is given for men and women today, then I've got to ask myself, what am I going to follow and who am I going to believe? The Methodist Church says women can preach over men. The Bible says, no, that's not right. And so are we going to take God at His Word? 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35, let your women keep silent in the churches. It's not a woman's place. There's a role, there's a specific position, there's specific duties that are given to women. But the Bible says women are not to be in an authority position in the church and God has not appointed them to stand up and preach and be an authority over a man. And so again, are we going to go with God in the Bible in these matters or the doctrines of men? Another thing that we consider about another doctrine that we consider about the Methodist church and what they believe uh, about God and salvation that is a very important one deals with uh, the idea of all believers. The Methodist church believes that the Christian church is the community of all believers under the Lordship of Christ. They would say there's nothing in a name. You can wear any name you desire. And yet they also don't believe that baptism is essential to salvation. This whole ecumenical idea that everybody's okay. You can go anywhere you want. You can have any flavor of religion you want as well. And that somehow that's going to be pleasing to God. Well, friend, when you think about the designations, the designations of ownership, that the Lord gave to His church, you can clearly find in the Bible that those are important. Jesus said, I'll build my church. Whose church? Not anybody's old church that they want to have. Jesus said, I'll build my church. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2 that it is the church belonging to God. Romans 16, 16, it is the church belonging to or the churches of God or the churches of Christ. The designations that you find in the Bible of ownership give glory to God, to Christ, to the Holy Spirit. They do not venerate men or the methods of men. Rather, they put God up on a pedestal as the owner and the builder of the church. And one of the things that we also want to consider about Methodist doctrine is that Methodists believe that babies are candidates for baptism and that pouring, sprinkling, or immersion are all acceptable methods of baptism. Friend, this idea of babies being baptized goes all the way back to the false doctrine of people being born in sin. That is, somehow, from Adam and Eve, because of their sin, all men are born sinners and lost and condemned and, and damned to hell. Well, friend, the Bible doesn't teach that as the case either. Romans 5 verse 12 says, Through one man sin entered into the world, and thus death spread to all men. Listen now, not because Adam sinned, because all sinned. Why do all men need to be saved from sin today? They didn't inherit the sin of Adam. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And so the idea of baptizing babies and sprinkling and pouring came about because people have the false conception that when a baby is born, it is born stained with the sin of Adam, and we don't want that baby to die lost in sin, and so we need to baptize it, but you can't take a, a little day-old baby and immerse it in water or you'll drown it. And so sprinkling and pouring. Came a part, became a part of that as well. And so built on a false doctrine, some more false methods have come in. Friend, you don't find in the Bible. What you find in the Scripture concerning the mode of baptism is always by immersion. You don't find sprinkling. 
and any babies or anybody else. You don't find pouring a little water on somebody's head. In every account in the New Testament, baptism is by immersion. Now the word itself, baptizo, literally means to plunge, to submerge, to dunk in the water. Carrying the idea of putting them all the way under, the word itself carries that idea. But friend, apart from the Greek language, you can look to the Bible and see that baptism is by immersion. Let, let, me, let me give you four examples of that. In John 3 verse 23, the Bible says John was baptizing in the region of Anon near Salim because there was much water there. Why does the Bible tell us he was baptizing somewhere where there was much water? doesn't take much water to sprinkle somebody. doesn't take much water to pour a little on their head. But friend, it takes much water. It takes a large amount of water to fully immerse somebody. And then I want you to consider the example of Jesus. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. People often ask the question, what would Jesus do? In Mark chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, at the baptism of Jesus, it says this, And as He was coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon Him like a dove. The little Greek word ek means out of. Think about this. To come up out of water, what do you first have to do? Go down into water. Jesus Himself was immersed. Romans 6 verses 1 through 4 may be the clearest example of all. Baptism is likened unto a burial. We're, we're buried with Christ in baptism, at which point we contact His death. Now think about the last time that you went to a cemetery and saw a burial. What did they do during that burial? Did they take the body and sprinkle a little dirt on it? Did they take a couple of shovelfuls and pour a little dirt on it? No, a burial, which is what Paul likens the mode of baptism to, a burial, they dig a hole in the ground. That body is placed all the way in that hole. There's dirt on the bottom. There's dirt on every side. And then they completely encase it in the ground. It is immersed in the dirt. Paul said baptism is a burial in which we contact the death of Christ. And then, of course, the example of the Ethiopian eunuch. They stopped the chariot. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch got down out of the chariot. They both went down into the water. He baptized him, and they came up out of the water. Why, why stop the chariot? Why, why both get out of the water? Why both get in the water? Why come up out of the water? Friend, the whole picture is that of immersion. And that's what we find every time in the Bible. And so the idea of baptizing babies is not something that we really find in the Scripture and is not something that's authorized by God. And then we mention one last doctrine to consider today, and that is the Methodist Church will often use instrumental music, mechanical instruments of music, in their assemblies. Even John Wesley was opposed to this. The founder of the Methodist Church, who's often looked at as John Wesley, condemned this when he said, I have no objection to instruments of music in our chapels, provided they are neither seen nor heard. John Wesley said, don't put them out there and don't let people hear them. If you're going to have, that's not something that's authorized by God. Friend, what we've got to realize is New Testament worship doesn't authorize mechanical instruments of music. If the Bible is our authority, and it is, and if we are guided today by the New Testament, John 12, 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I've spoken in the last day will judge him. If we're guided by the New Testament and the Bible as our authority. And friend, here's what the Bible says about music and worship. Ephesians 5.19 says in Colossians 3.16, Singing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. We're to sing. We're to make melody in our heart. We're to sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. We are to teach and admonish one another. But what you don't find is the mechanical instrument of music in the worship of the church. It's absolutely silent. Every example of singing as it relates to the worship of God's people in the New Testament, there's the absence of the instrument. God wants us to make melody in the heart. Well, how do we do that? 1 Corinthians 14, 15 tells us, I'll sing with the Spirit 
and I'll sing with the understanding, the beautiful voice that God has given us, the ability to think about those words and to, to worship and engage our mind in that. That's how God has asked us to worship in the New Testament. And so, friend, as we think about various doctrines of the Methodist Church, all we ask is that you examine these doctrines for yourself. See if this, this is what's really taught in this religious organization. And then, friend, if it is, we just challenge you to get your own Bible and see if the verses we've mentioned today, if that's what they say. See if they're true to the Word of God. And, and if you find those things to be true, and friend, just simply obey the Bible because that's what God wants us to do. What is it that God's concerned about in my life and yours? Jesus said it's not everybody that just looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going to be saved, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It was the Lord Jesus Christ who said this, If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. He would later say in John 15, verse 14, You're my friend if you do whatever I ask you. Friend, when we obey just the Bible, when we follow just the teaching of God, when we leave denominational ideas, the, the, the bias and the prejudice and the teachings of men that just so clearly contradict the Bible, and we leave those behind, friend, we can know. We can know because we're following the Bible that what we're doing is true to God and true to His Word. Friend, as always, we want to encourage you, as we mentioned the outset, to visit the Lord's Church in your area. If you'd like to study more about this idea or you'd like to have a, a home Bible study, they'd be glad to help you with that as well as us here at the Gospel of Christ. You can write, if you've got more questions, you'd like to learn more about denominational doctrine or various ideas in the Bible, please write to us or call us or send us an email. We'd be glad to help you in any way that we can in your study of the Word of God. And friend, we want to leave you with this idea. We want you to know that the God of heaven loves you deeply and that we love you. We're concerned about your soul. More, we're, not, we're not concerned about your wallet or your money or anything like that. We're concerned about you going to heaven. May God help each of us to let the gospel of Christ be our guide as we strive to live for the Lord. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.